really pleased to open the session and uh, get it going so we can hear from Sarah Suzanka. Uh, and I, let me just take care of a little mundane business. AIA sign-in sheets are over at the tables there. So we're going to have an introduction of um, the overall session and what Sarah and CNU have in common and why it's so great to have her here today. Then John McClendon, developer of Streetscape um, Development, is going to introduce Sarah and then she'll speak. Uh, so I knew that I was going to open this session with Sarah about three months ago and as I've been preparing for this and rereading the not so big house and talking to Sarah, I've gotten more and more excited about it partly because I think it's an opportunity to reconnect Sarah and CNU. We do have a lot in common. Uh, I've been remembering how back in the 90s, Sarah was one of the first people to talk about living in homes that are smaller and higher quality. To us in the new urbanism movement, that's not a new idea. They're, these are very familiar ideas, and they're in fact built into our philosophy. They're in our charter. So we've had that connection for a long time. But I have come to appreciate how significant her, her body of work individually is and how focused she's been over this, this intervening time. Since the publication of The Not So Big House in 1998, she's published nine books and on her own has launched a one-woman movement about it called The Not So Big Life. And it never fails to amaze me what a widespread audience Sarah has, from developers and home builders to average consumers of the American home, her, her audience her, is very passionate. Uh, she has fans and followers, not unlike the CNU founders. I've heard that people have changed their careers to follow her and be more aligned with the work that she's doing. And getting to know her over the last couple of weeks, I've learned about how she started out as a child growing up in an English village and moved to Los Angeles at a young age and began asking questions like, uh, where are the footpaths? And where are the shops and how do people meet each other? And that must have been a kind of a shock from an English village to Los Angeles. Um, but she's taken that interest and passion and turned it into her career, one that's very closely connected and is really part of new urbanism. The importance of neighborhood patterns hit her, on, hit her early on in life. And later she studied a pattern language with Christopher Alexander and as I've had the opportunity to talk to her, I've, gotten, I've remembered that we went to the same university to get our architecture degrees, the University of Oregon. That's where Christopher Alexander was at that time. I've been looking at Sarah's achievements and wanting to know what can she teach us in CNU about how we talk about our work and who we tell our story to. Sarah's so good at understanding the simplicity that's needed in the marketplace and delivering to the consumer preference for small, high-quality homes. And she's so skilled, as she puts it, at explaining what we do to people who really have no idea what it is that we do. Now, we're a very different audience, and I think Sarah usually speaks too. Uh, but I know she's going to talk to us about some of the things that she talks to her other audiences about how if we look at the possibilities, if we know in our heart what would make a better place to live, that we could change places that seem deficient in a generation. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing what she has to tell us. Uh, John McClendon is going to come up here and talk about streetscape development and how, to, how he found his way to Sarah. That's an interesting story in itself. Um, he's developed School Street in Liberty, Illinois with Sarah and managed to sell homes, as he, call, as he says, using new urbanism, to sell homes in the worst market in our history. Their unique home selling process, I hope he's going to talk about that, the show house and the interview process that they go through with their home buyers is uh, fascinating. And I hope he'll also share with us some of his plans for the home building industry. So let me welcome John McClendon to the uh, good morning. Uh, my name is John McClendon with Streetscape Development. I am thrilled to be here uh, today and tell you um, our little story about School Street and how the uh, stars lined up over School Street and then importantly the intersection between new urbanism and Sarah. So 
with that. We loved our slogan. We just took the, uh, the sign that we all know and love and put a chimney on it. So that worked out pretty good. So where is Libertyville? Libertyville is a uh, Chicago suburb. It's about 35, five, uh, 35 miles north. It's a community of about 20,000 people. It has, uh, if you look at the uh, site plan there, the vertical street is Milwaukee Avenue, which is the, uh, the main street. And then School Street site is to the right, which is about four acres. The, the hero of the story is the village of Libertyville. Uh, they recognized this was an important site for the vibrancy and the continued vibrancy of their downtown. They systematically, over 30 years, acquired the site. Onesie twosie, buying houses. The first house they bought was in 1976. In addition, there was a historic school that they purchased that was the last piece of the acquisition. So we got a great downtown to work with. <clears throat> I think it's very important to talk about the time that this was done. So you just saw where, where it was and now when it was. So this was in 2010, the worst market in probably all of our lifetimes from a residential standpoint. We, um, we started at that point, and can you imagine what it was like to talk to private, we, need, read it, we raised uh, millions of dollars of private equity. Can you imagine that conversation with the investor? We got this great idea, we're gonna do these cool houses. We're gonna pre-sell them with no, off of preliminary drawings, with, uh, with no model, and we're gonna do it in 2010. So that didn't go over real well, but uh, we were able to convince uh, a, a few people to get behind the project. The project started out, excuse me, <coughs> as a red field. Now, everybody's likely heard of a green field and a brown field. A red field is a new term, and essentially that's a deal gone bad. So the first developer didn't make it here. The original development plan was uh, townhomes, which are shown in the, uh, in the background. These were 29-foot wide, 3,500-square-foot townhomes selling from 850 to a million dollars. To the left, um, kind of a Jurassic Park image of a school behind there. Uh, that's the historic school that we started with, which really authenticates the name of the street. And um, you know, we love the connection to the community. So we realized we had to reinvent this project. We also realized we needed a big, a big idea. And thank you, everybody in New Urbanism and, and John Norquist, who I contacted. And New Urbanism was the uh, the headliner to our story. So we started with the idea of creating a close-knit, compact community. And this was the actual uh, preliminary document we used to sell the homes. <clears throat> this was the existing site plan. To the right uh, of this, vertically to the right, there would be the existing five townhomes. That developer sold four, and then the bank foreclosed. So that's as far as they got. <clears throat> what we wanted to do is to simplify the process as much as possible. Those were the 26 sites there shown, designed for attached 29-foot wide townhomes. So we did something outrageous and said, we're going to make single-family homes on 29-foot wide lots in the suburbs. So there's the plan. The existing school is there. <coughs> Excuse me. We created a uh, streetscape view, bungalow style, uh, beloved bungalows in the 1920s. We developed preliminary plans, and we took them only this far. We named each plan after a historic person in the, uh, in the village. This is Walter Newberry, who brought the train line to Libertyville uh, about 100 years ago. And this is what we use to sell the homes, because we believe you know, the home is the ultimate co uh, consumer product. So we wanted to have our customers drive what the plans were. It's not going to be our house. It's going to be our customer's home. And what we did was, um, we developed eight different plans, different, you know, kitchens in the front, the middle, the back. But the, importantly, there was a reservation uh, uh, fee that we charge our, our customers. 2500 bucks gets them in the game, and that's non-refundable. But then we have a design meeting. First design meeting, we, the first question we ask is this. How do you live? And, and predictably now, we know that people react very funny to that question because they're expecting, gee, how many bedrooms do you want? And how many, you know, all the, all the typical attributes. That, well, that, that'll come later, of course, but the important thing is how do they live and what's important to them and, and how do they see themselves living in this new community? And that was the kind of the silver bullet here. Second silver bullet, maybe the first is Sarah. We'll get to that. 
but this is an important question. So then we developed the, uh, you know, some of the imagery, and we, as I looked at this, I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be cool to have a, you know, I knew of Sarah's work, wouldn't it be cool to have a not-so-big house in the lineup here? It would fit so comfortably with, uh, with, our, with our streetscape. Well, what I quickly learned is you don't pick up the phone and call Sarah. Uh, it took me about, well, I fact-checked this, 25 exchanges with her business affairs manager over about a four or five month period. And finally, uh, Barbara uh, told me after the 4th of July weekend of uh, 2010 that Sarah spent the weekend with the, looking at our stuff for the, you know, that I sent umpteen times. And she finally agreed to talk to me. We had a conference call three weeks later, Sarah was in our conference room. And, uh, you know, we'll continue on with this story in a moment about Sarah. So <clears throat> this was the overall uh, image from, this, from the aerial view, which is really not the, you know, not the important thing. It's rather, what does it look like from the street? And these images are what helped us sell these homes, along with the big new urbanism story. I'll tell you something really funny is that the village, nobody heard of new urbanism. Today, everybody's buzzing about new urbanism. The mayor's talking about it, the village managers, the, the citizens are talking about it. It's awesome. Um, on the right-hand side, upper right-hand side, that's one of those I had a dream speech pictures. And on the left-hand side is what's been built. So that's uh, about 18 months into it on the left-hand side. We are now sold out. We'll finish the project uh, at the end of this year completely. 20, uh, 20 homes are occupied. There's some happy campers illustrated on the bottom left. That's Joe and Stephanie with their kids. Some more pictures of the street, not great pictures with the, the daylighting, but that was taken uh, just a few days ago. And uh, we could, <laughs> couldn't be more excited about, about this project, the fact that you know, there's an alignment between what we did and New Urbanism and Sarah. And now finally, we get to Sarah. So, uh, you know, Marcy told you a little bit about Sarah's background. Here's my version. So Sarah was born in Kent, England, which is a tiny little town or village. Um, Sarah's dad was an inventor, and he was working on a project that was similar to, his invention was similar to the, uh, the Frisbee. So Mattel hired him, and Sarah moved to Los Angeles from little tiny village to Los Angeles. So a little bit of culture shock for a 14-year-old girl. Sarah grew up to be an architect. She had a very, very successful practice in Minneapolis. And um, in 1998, she had this, she's always been thinking, I think, about the idea of living better, not bigger. And in 1998, she thought, I'm going to write a book, architect full-time, part-time author, see how that goes. Well, what Sarah probably didn't realize is in 1998, she wrote this book. And by the way, at that time, you know, everybody, that was very counter to what was going on in the world, right? Everybody's going big. Sarah's talking about going small. So she was way ahead of this. Uh, a couple weeks later, it was Amazon's bestseller. Some number of months later, Oprah contacted her, as I think the story goes. And, um, you know, fast forward now, she has written nine books, sold millions of copies. And um, we, again, contacted her. Finally, she came. She'll tell you probably about her first visit. But what Sarah agreed for us, and, and very luckily for us, is that for the first time ever, she did a show house design in a private development. And what was important to Sarah was that this show house was done so that people could walk through it, instead of paging through her books, so people could actually walk through and see what it felt like. Because that's really what this is about, right? What it feels like. It's not about, you know, how big or square footage. If you ask somebody about where the favorite room in their house, they're not going to tell you, gee, let me tell you about this. It was nine feet tall. No, they're going to tell you about the window seat or the light or the color or the smell or the sound of the screen door slamming. They're not going to talk about how big it is. So we did this show house. Uh, it was open for a limited amount of time uh, on, for a six-month period for limited hours on the weekends. Now, again, think of when this was. This was, this was now 2012 and um, how difficult it is, any developers out there, builders out there, to get someone into your, right, to get somebody into your uh, model, right? The open house, you might have the neighbor and the, you know, the, you know, three people show up and their relatives. We had 9,000 visitors. We didn't advertise, it was just on our website, it was on Sarah's website. People got in airplanes to come and see this extraordinary home that Sarah designed. And, uh, they, got, they came from all over. The furthest visitor was from Israel, 
a woman that was a, a PhD and studying a very specific uh, element of home design and, and, and related to entries. And she made the comparison of what uh, Marie Montessori did for education, creating a pre prepared environment to what Sarah did in this home. So her point was Sarah created a prepared environment for living. And with that, I'll introduce Sarah. And um, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, all, all of you, for being here and for inviting me. Um, I have felt for so long that we have these parallel movements and attracting very similar people. And uh, I was reminded that I actually did come to a CNU um, annual conference in 1996. I think there were about 50 people there. And uh, so it's a very different world than uh, what has developed uh, today. It's really exciting. And I can't tell you how much I've learned just by being here for the last couple of days and absorbing your energy and your enthusiasm and your understanding of what you're doing. It's amazing. And, you know, I'm gonna, my remarks today are going to take you through stuff that you know. I don't want to pretend I'm inventing anything that you don't already know. But what I want to orient you to is two things. One is, how do we make these ideas simple enough for people who aren't trained in architecture, aren't trained in design, aren't trained in planning, to understand that what you're doing, what we as architects are doing, is what they want. And that's really the core of everything that I've written about. It's just trying to connect to people's values. Because they really, truly do not understand that, in my case with architecture, that architects were the, were the ones that were designing all the cool houses that they saw in the magazines. They just did not understand that. So in planning and in urban design, that's the same issue. They don't know who to go to. They don't yet really, many people know the word, the new ur urbanism. We have to start to bring that into everyday language so that we're sharing what we know. And so the other part of my message is going to be really to help you look at what do I know and how do I bring that out into the world in a larger way, not just to colleagues, not just to people who already know it, but to the larger marketplace. I know some of you are already doing this. But this is really the core of what needs to happen right now. And this is how the change in our world is happening before our very eyes. But it's up to us, the people in this room, to really help make that shift. So I'm going to take you on a very short course through um, the, what Not So Big is all about. And I want to ask a question. Before this conference, how many of you did not know what Not So Big is? Don't feel embarrassed. <laughs> OK, so that's probably about five to ten percent of the audience. How many of you have uh, read one or more of the Not So Big House books? And how many of you have read or at least a little bit of the Not So Big Life? All right. Well, you're going to get a crash course in all the things that I talk about, and you're going to learn where they came from and how they have affected people, why they've affected people, because I think that's really the core of what CNU in particular is interested in here, is how do, do people feel so motivated to start thinking about building a not-so-big house? So John and Marcy both mentioned that I grew up in um, a little village in Kent, England. Um, the village of Knockholt is the picture that you see on the bottom of your slide. That, this was actually the, our village center, and when I lived there, that white house was actually the local um, grocery store. And so I walked there every day to, with my mother to buy groceries. I lived in a world where you walked everywhere. And so the footpaths, although these are not actually not called footpaths, very similar ways of getting around. And so the land was the way that I knew how to make my way in the world. When I've been listening to the remarks from um, the various speakers over the last few days, the thought of children not having the ability to just move around their world and learn about nature and learn about interconnectedness through walking seems, or running, <laughs> seems so sad because that was my world. And as John mentioned, when I moved to Los Angeles, it's as though 
probably 90% of the way that I interacted in the world was taken away. I remember walking up to the, um, basically the strip mall that was up the hill from my family's house in Los Angeles, it was about a two mile walk, in tears. I could not believe that this was what I had to do to find the places that would sell me something. I knew that some huge part of my heart had been ripped away in moving to this place in Los Angeles. Not that it wasn't a lovely neighborhood. It was, for those of you that know LA, it was um, Palos Verdes. It's a beautiful area. But there was no way to run into people. And it really, really saddened me. So at the age of 14, I knew that I was going to make a difference somehow in bringing an awareness of what it is that makes a place vital and vibrant. And so really, as I look back over my whole career at this point, I see that that motivation started the day that I arrived in 1971. Now I want to, to bookend this talk with a phrase that many of you will know from Mahatma Gandhi. He said, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. And one of the things that I talk about in several of my books, but most um, probably poignantly in The Not So Big Life, is that I don't believe we fully understand what he means by that phrase. So I'm going to come back at the end of my talk and help you to see how what you're doing in the world and what you're doing in your own life is where that change evolves from. So I'll just plant the seed right now. What I saw in my own life, and especially as I started working as an architect, in, um, I've, I got my degree from the University of Oregon, which is where Marcy and I, I, I met her the other day, and I said, I know you, and I'm absolutely certain that we uh, must have crossed paths or shared a class um, together. But um, the University of Oregon was a wonderful place to go to school. It really gave me a sense of how to connect with people. One of the things that's very rare for those of you that are architects in the audience, architecture school tends to be um, fairly harsh in terms of its uh, jurying process of projects. So people get kind of hardened to that and they learn that they have to sort of fight to get their ideas across. The University of Oregon was exactly the opposite. They didn't even use the word jury for um, the evaluation of a project. They called it a review. And the people that we were working for, the clients, were absolutely the most important part of every project. And so for me, as I, as I worked through that process of um, architecture school, and then as I started as a young architect, I wanted to find out how do people feel at home in their houses and in their lives, and how can I help that to flourish within the place that I design. And so I started a business in 1983 with my um, actually my master's thesis, Dale Mulfinger, we're not related in any way other than we had a business together. And we both had this belief that we needed to go to where the people were needing what we do. And so we actually went to the local home and garden shows. We hung out a, booth, hung out a shingle at, at um, the, the home and garden shows. Other architects thought we were crazy. And we got over 50% of our clients for the first four years of our business from that source. We found that middle class America was desperate for design help. They just didn't realize that architects were who could help them. And so we began to focus on how do people look for home and how can we as architects help to bring that service to them rather than having to have them discover that it is in fact us that do the work that they need. And we discovered very quickly that when people were coming to our office they had a budget that was out of line with the pictures they were bringing and the square footage they were asking for. And we quickly realized what this uh, young girl uh, obviously was enamored with, uh, Daddy's Boots, that we all look for something big because we think it's going to make us feel better. And so that scale is what people crave. They think it's going to make a better life. And so we had to somehow articulate the notion that it's not about bigness, that the quality that you're looking for doesn't reside there. We also started to ask the question, when do we know we have enough? In this culture, we have so much, you know, obviously post-recession a little bit less than we had before the recession, but we, we started to look at what is it that people are really looking for? 
I keep looking for, for where's the edge of where we've got enough, where we know we've got enough. But we really don't seem to ever get there. So we, we ask for more food, more shelter, more security. And, and we're, aim, we're looking for something that's going to make us feel better. And the fact is that more of these things, after you've got enough of them, can't fill that void inside us. There's something else that's being pointed to, but we don't have another model. And so right about the middle of the 90s, I started to realize I wanted to speak what it is that people are really looking for that they don't really know. And so all of my clients, all of my audiences, when I spoke at the Home and Garden shows, they're looking for the feeling of home, but they're looking with the wrong tool. They're looking with square footage, with gathering stuff, when in fact that feeling of home is a quality and not a quantity. And so you can keep building bigger and bigger and bigger, and it will never, ever satisfy. And so that's really the core of this not-so-big message. It's really an attitude about how to find that sense of home within your own life. Now, the parallel interest that I've had all through my life has been related to community. And as all of you in this room know absolutely better than almost anybody on the planet, community is a quality, too. It's all about relationship. It's about how we find each other, how we meet, just like that story I told of myself as a young um, teenager. Where do we meet people in Los Angeles? You, you know, it was very difficult to do that. So we're creating the places where people meet. And before I ever got into um, an architectural job, I actually joined forces with a group of people, very idealistic people, in Oregon who were creating a new town. We would today probably call it a new urban community. It, was, it had some co-housing, it had some cluster housing, it had a lot of people wanting to rethink how we get to and from our houses, how to rethink traffic uh, patterns, how to build narrower streets, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing about this community, it was called Cerro Gordo, it's still around, was that the people that came they arrived first. The community was already there before the land was being used. So we had this incredibly strong sense of community. At the age of 19, I had burned out on uh, community meetings and potlucks and trying to find solutions through consensus. If anybody tries consensus, I don't advise it. <laughs> it generates about 10 times more meetings than you really need. But, um, but I learned so much from that experience. I got to work with the architect that was working with the community, and I started to realize, this is where the pattern of trying to help people understand what architects are doing and what planners are doing, I started to realize that a lot of the people that were attracted to this community did not understand what the architect was talking about. And so I began to teach about a pattern language. I'd actually had the great good fortune of working with two of the people who were with Christopher Alexander as he generated these patterns for a pattern language. Those of you that aren't familiar with this book, buy a copy, page through it, learn some of what is there. And I know many of you at CNU use this a lot in your own work. But the point is that a pattern language gave people access to ideas that are really innate. What Alexander talks about is that we all understand building, but somehow we've been divided from it by professionals who don't allow the, the average homeowner in to understand what we're doing. I wanted to change that. And so I put this little brochure together, and this was when I was 20 years old, so it was 1977. Um, just as a little pamphlet to help people who were part of the community understand what was possible. And so all of you who are familiar with a pattern language will recognize the, the words. I'm not going to belabor them here. But just, I would do these presentations where I would show an image from Europe or from a beautiful area around the, the world where there was an idea like path network, um, cluster housing, um, learning network, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes, where the whole world becomes your learning environment as a child. So important. That's how we get a sense of the larger world. And just introducing very, very simple concepts that allowed the community to feel like they could participate in the design process. And it was hugely powerful. It was um, all of those of you who have been to a charrette 
or, or conducted one, know this feeling that comes when people are just overwhelmed with a certain kind of joy at being able to touch something that they didn't know they even were going to be able to participate in. It's extraordinary. It brings people together so that they know this is it. This is what I want. And that's what I've been involved in my whole life. I'm so fortunate. And those of you that do this, I know you know what I mean. It's an incredible gift to connect with human beings in that way. So after doing that work in Oregon, I was, again, fairly fortunate in being able to start this firm with my um, master's thesis advisor, Dale Mulfinger, and we ended up developing a residential architecture practice focused right at that middle class market. So people that largely would not have gone to architects other than the fact that uh, we existed. We ended up being a firm, when I left in 1999, a firm of 45 people doing single family residential uh, design. Now for those of you that are architects, you know that's pretty unusual. There's a whole other talk I could give about how we created the model that allowed us to do that, but it was very cooperative and collaborative. I was the managing partner. I also got to do some design because of the innovative way that we'd structured our firm. And I realized that here was this incredible thing that we'd created, but for me, there was one thing missing. All my life, since I was about 11 years old, I had loved to write. This was actually a drawing that I did and I think it says 1974, so that was the year I, I graduated from high school. I loved to write. I felt like something poured out of me when I wrote. But once I was an architect and, and running this residential architecture firm, there was no way I had time to write. I just, the, how was I going to do it? Where was I going to find the time? And so I started to think about that, and I had some sadness about it. And I gradually, it came into my awareness that the the way that I was actually defining myself was that I was, whenever somebody would ask me, you know, how are you, I would say, oh, I'm too busy. And I, there's a phrase I want you to remember, our thoughts are the architecture of our world. So I was telling everybody I was too busy. I was creating that world of too busyness. And I, I gradually came to the recognition that I was in the cage. My own words were shaping that cage, and I couldn't possibly escape it unless I made some change in my own life. And so I'd started to think about this. I knew I wanted to find the time to write. And then I went to an AIA convention, and I had the um, honor, I think, of being in the same room as Paul Hawken. How many of you in here have heard Paul, Paul Hawken speak? Awesome, awesome speaker. So there were thousands of architects in this audience. And he basically implored us to recognize that we were leaders, that we could help shape the world. And I want you to hear the same message today in ways far beyond what you're imagining. But he said something incredibly important. He said, follow your hearts. And for me, he was saying, speak what you know. I knew I needed to write these books about what I'd learned from people that were coming in asking for 3,000 square foot houses when all they could really afford were 1,500 square feet. I knew the, basically the equation to help make that house for that person wonderful, but I had to help make the argument about how they could reduce the amount of square footage they needed in order to create that great house. And so I felt like Paul Hawken was speaking right to me. And it was that along with a, a, a sort of epiphany I had one night when I was um, reading to try to sort of clear my mind of all the junk that was in it from the day so that I could actually go to sleep. And I realized if I didn't make a change to start writing, it was never going to happen. Nobody was going to do it for me. And so I did something that may seem ridiculous. I actually created a new client number for myself, penciled myself into my own calendar, and said, that's your writing time. And at the time, I can say it now, it sounds simple, but I felt like I was doing something very bad. I thought all my clients were going to um, you know, throw their arms up and say, you know, what are you doing? You're taking time for yourself, and my partners were going to be angry. None of that happened. When you do something that your heart longs to do, you will be amazed at how you're supported. Everything moved to allow that to happen, including getting a publisher, 
who was right on board with my message, who was able to tell me I actually wanted to write Home by Design, which is my fourth book, as my first book. The publisher was able to tell me, Sarah, that's a wonderful idea, but you've got to cultivate your audience first. You have to write an entry book that allows people to come in and find out what it is you're talking about. So I wrote The Not So Big House. They were suggesting originally that I write The Small House book, and I knew that wasn't the right name. I wanted to be able to get to the people building the five and 6,000 square feet houses and say, look, there's a better way. You don't need all that square footage. What you need is a house that feels like home. And I can't tell you how many people have read this book and read it in a night. They don't go to sleep. <clears throat> they just read and read and read and say, that's what I want. And I've heard it from architects, from builders, from homeowners, from real estate agents. Everybody gets affected by it because it's so darned simple. That that's the trick for us as professionals, is to realize that it's the simplicity that helps people enter what we do. And I think if anything, I, I almost didn't uh, finish writing this book because they told me, write it for an eighth grade audience. I was insulted. You know, I'm a, I'm a good writer, and they want me to dumb it down? They were so right because it allows people to engage. It doesn't have to show your ability to write long words. It doesn't have to show that you can impress your, your fellow colleagues. This is about communication. And once I grasped that, and it was a huge lesson, everything shifted, because the simplicity is what speaks. What I learned over the years of working with my clients, and since then, since um, uh, these books have come out, is that the people who are attracted to this message are almost universally looking for a different kind of place to live. And by that, I mean both house and community, incidentally. They're looking for a place that's beautiful, that sustains them, that's often got green or sustainable technologies interwoven, that's by its very nature smaller but better, because that's what they're looking for, that sense of quality rather than quantity. And they really, they really understand that home is their sanctuary. It's not the place to knock the socks off their neighbors. There are plenty of people in our culture who want to sock, knock the socks off their neighbors, but these guys are not that group. And they felt completely disenfranchised. So the only houses they were buying were bigger houses or houses that exist, I mean, uh, bigger houses that they had to somehow make smaller, or houses that already existed in inner ring suburbs that they could make feel the way they wanted for today. But they didn't realize they could build a new house too. And so a lot of what I've been talking about is really helping to create a simple formula that allows people, no matter whether they're hiring an architect or not, to make their house better. So not so big I often say it's really a sensibility, and paradoxically, it's not really about size. People will often say, so how big is a not-so-big house? It can be almost any size, but it's probably about a third smaller than you thought you needed, so that you reapportion dollars out of square footage and into quality and character. And so the people that are attracted to this message, some of them are building bigger houses than most of us in this room would, would uh, choose to live in, but they are beautiful and they work for them. Every space is in use every day. It's built to last and it's built to inspire them. There are, so a not so big house really has that quality of being lived in. We don't have these acres of space that are rarely if ever visited. And so I built this house for myself in St. Paul to illustrate this concept and just to show that you can take the informal eating area and by designing it well and doing good lighting, you can turn that into the formal dining area for those occasions when you have friends over. And I make really dumb, simple observations, like when you're having people over for dinner, it's not the king and queen of England. It's Joe and Kathy from next door, and they actually want to be in your kitchen where you are. You know, it's, duh, but we don't think that. We don't think that. I've even designed kitchens where, you know, when people are worried and they say, oh, I don't want people to see the mess that in, in my kitchen, and I've designed these beautiful shoji screens that will close the kitchen off when you have that formal dinner, and then I've been invited for that formal dinner after the house is done. Do you think the shoji screens ever get closed? Never. Never. Not once. We have this notion of how we live, but we don't really live that way. So I've been trying to bust those myths and help people realize 
that this is for me. This is my house. This is the place that I live, and it needs to be an expression of who I am. If it is that, people will want to be with where I am. So not so big houses come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from the Katrina cottage that you see on the top um, left-hand side to um, the, the other houses that are all pretty classic uh, not so big houses that you've seen in my books. The one on the bottom left is the house that I designed for my, myself in St. Paul. And all of these homes are, the, the key ingredient is every space is used every day. Now one of the, the simplest ideas that I found to help communicate to people who aren't architecturally designed, aren't trained in design at all, that they are um, missing something incredibly important about the built environment, is that we all as human beings have a spatial awareness. Some of us have more of a spatial awareness and some of us have less. It's a lot like a musical ear. Most of us know what we like, but some people have perfect pitch, while other people can't tell if a note goes up or down. But we still have an appreciation for music. Same thing with space, but we have, until my books came out and pattern language came out, almost no language with which to describe those spaces. So the first thing I do is try to connect people to their spatial sense. And the best way to do that is take them back in their memories to when they were about the age of this kid. We all had some spot that we liked to hang out. For me, it was my, uh, the cupboard under the stairs in my house in England, where I could look out and I could see into the kitchen, the hallway, and the living room. So I had a sense of shelter, but I could see a lot of the rest of the, the goings on in the house. So I asked people to get a bead on that and then recognize that that's what we actually are very often missing in our own houses. And yet that's what we long for, a sense of shelter, but also vista. Then I ask them to think about how they go about designing a house or building a house and how they find the plans to do that work, whether it's remodeling or new construction. And I use this metaphor. When you look at a map of a city, we understand absolutely clearly that it tells us nothing about the character of the city. It tells us how to get a car from place to place or a feet from place to place if it's closer in, but we wouldn't even in a thousand years imagine that it would tell us what it feels like. Well, a map of a house is a floor plan. It also doesn't tell you what it feels like. Now, when I tell a general public audience that, you can literally feel the electricity moving through the room because up until that moment, they thought that the reason they hadn't been able to build their dream house, despite the fact that they'd built four of them, was that they had just been dumb. They hadn't known that this plan was, was not a good one. I point out the information as to whether or not this is a good house doesn't exist on the floor plan. For that, you need information about the third dimension. And so just helping people understand that the third dimension hugely affects our experience is really the core of my message. And so many of you who've been to my talks before have seen that kid in the cardboard box and go, oh gosh, I've seen this before. But it's really the point. It's how you connect people to what they're missing. And that little idea changes everything. I don't know what the little idea is within new, the new urbanism. But there's something like that that will make people get it. And that's what we need to find, identify, and start talking about. And so um, the, two of the principles that I often talk about when I have just a short period of time are this one, light to walk toward. It's not just a near-death experience. We are literally programmed to move towards light. And so you put a, a, light, a lighted painting at the end of a, a hallway instantly it's transformed into something much more appealing, much more uh, dramatic than when you don't have that light there. Think about all the hallways in bungalows and in uh, ranch houses that terminate in a, a blank wall and the, uh, the light fixture in the center of the ceiling um, halfway down the hallway. It's drab, people don't like that hallway, they don't like the room so it gets to put a lighted painting at the end. It changes the entire feeling of their experience of their house. So it's simple stuff like that. It's literally like turning a light bulb on. 
So now I get to um, tell you just a little bit of how I've been using those ideas over the years in show houses to illustrate what it is that I'm talking about. I have actually done, I think, four uh, show houses at this point. And the, the, the three first ones were at the Builder Show, the International Builder Show. And it suddenly occurred to me after the third one, which any of you who've done show houses, it's an immense amount of work. It was open for a week. The only people that got to go through it were builders. And builders can't do anything unless the homeowner's asking for that product. So I realized I'm talking to the wrong people. The builders are getting it now. But I need to be able to show these houses and let them be walked through by homeowners. And so I was looking for a developer builder team with the awareness that this would be a good idea to have a house open for six months so that people could walk through it. And that's where um, John McClendon comes in. I had actually been trying to court the larger scale builders. Part of the reason I wasn't answering my phone. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to the, the Pultes and the Beezers and the Centexes, and every time I thought I was getting somewhere and I thought we were going to be able to create a, um, a show house and a product, somebody further up the chain uh, said, you know, well, we can't do that. If it's going to cost one cent more per square foot, forget it. You know, even though I knew they really needed what I was talking about, they couldn't get through that barrier. So then I looked through what John McClendon had sent me, and suddenly I realized, this is perfect. Here is a location where somebody's asking me to do a show house in a not-so-big community, Libertyville, Illinois, the most charming small town, on a street that's right off of Main Street, right there on Milwaukee Avenue. So walking distance um, by a block to the main hub of activity in the town. I couldn't have thought of a better spot. And so it allowed me to tell the story of aging in place, of walkability, of a front porch community, of the new urbanism and how new urbanism can meet uh, not so big. And it drew people like crazy. When you look at this photo, a lot of people who aren't uh, aware of, of um, how these narrow lots work look at it and say, well, that's a huge house. It's actually um, 2,450 square feet. So it's still at the sort of average size of an American home. But it, it is built into it are every one of the ideas that I've talked about. Now, there's pieces of this house that I want to draw particular attention to for you guys because there's a part of what I know and what I do in my house designs that I think would be very valuable to interweave into the new urbanism. And that has to do with how we distribute rooms if we're going to have a front porch community. If you're going to have a front porch that really gets used, you've got to put a space next to it that's used a lot by the family, or it will sit there and nobody will use it. It will look pretty, but you got, in order to get people there, you've got to have it be a natural flow within the house. And so, I designed my version of the um, School Street um, house design. Twi it's 29 foot wide lot, remember, so it's long and thin. So that the kitchen and the dining area are up front so that they can bleed out onto the front porch um, when you've finished your meal. It's very easy to just extend out into the street. I think that should be fundamental to how we're designing houses within new urban communities, because that's where the vibrancy starts. And then I also did another thing. I'll show you a photograph in a second. I moved the stairway from right across the front entry to the back of the house. So often we use the stairway as a kind of sculpture, so you're walking your guest into the stairway, but they never get to go up there. So what I do is I move the stairway where it's accessible for the family, and particularly in a long, thin house like that, that is so critical because you, in order to have the connection from the kitchen to the living room, if you've got a stairway taking up most of the width of the house, you're not going to have that connectedness, and so then the living room wouldn't get used. So in this house, those two little ideas were core. The other part was that because these houses are densely packed together, Although you could do a small garden in between one house and another, it would also feel like it was in an elevator shaft. And so I put the, the garden space on the roof of the garage. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. So stairway in the front, all the top, I mean, uh, kitchen in the front, um, all the things that I talk about related to ceiling height variety, 
uh, creating differentiation of places using that, uh, that variation in ceiling height. All these things are applied here. And pe so people could walk through and understand what it was they were looking at and why it works. To be able to feel it is so much different than in a photograph. And then looking through the house, that long view, I talk about interior views being incredibly important in how we shape our experience. And so that long view through, the very far end is actually a mudroom. And I'll show you in a second. It's a beautiful view. You don't know it's a mudroom until you actually walk all the way back into the house where that becomes apparent. And we, I've put the dining area so that it does double duty, just like in my house in St. Paul, so it can be both formal and informal. Now, there are a few occasions when you really do need a bigger table. And so in this house, you can actually pick the table up and move it to an alcove. If you look at this picture, the alcove is on the left. And you can move the living room furniture just a bit so that you can extend the table all the way across this space. There's one day a year in most families' lives, Thanksgiving, where they need that larger table. It's not a big deal to move a couple of pieces of furniture so that you can accommodate that one occasion. So, you know, just a simple idea, but it makes so much sense, and that's the kind of thing that people grasp onto and say, yeah, that's what I want. Oh, just let me go back for one second. And so there you can see the mudroom, the lighted painting, light to walk towards. It draws you through so that you have a sense of um, the house being quite a bit bigger than it actually is. And the stairway is behind that screen, so that um, it's, it's there, it's still sculptural, and it's actually a light shaft that also serves as a, um, a solar chimney, so that the house can naturally cool itself. So there's a lot of things going on in this house. I always forget to mention that all of the houses that I do are very energy efficient. It's woven right into the fabric of the house. They're sustainable and energy efficient. So it needs, it's at the core of the not so big message. And then here is the uh, rooftop garden. This is actually on the garage roof. And I've designed it so that it actually looks like a, a two-story house that you're looking at. That's actually, we're looking at the second floor and the third floor. So simple stuff like that that makes it feel like home, but in a new and innovative way. For those of you that are interested in some of the specifics of uh, ceiling height variety, which is really how to shape space without using walls to separate one space from another, in more not so big solutions for your home, which there are some copies of here, there's two chapters that go through it in depth. And um, one is uh, unifying an interior with horizontal trim, and the other one is improving a McMansion with ceiling height variety. An unfortunate name because it's actually applicable to any house, but my uh, publisher wouldn't let me write more than one chapter about it, so <laughs> that's, that's how I didn't, came to be that one. Now, in terms of what we're doing here in CNU, you had a visitor last year in Lee Gallagher, some of you will remember her, and she has written a book called The End of the Suburbs, which talks, I mean, there's one chapter devoted to CNU. You get a lot of really good press. She's also interviewed uh, John McClendon and myself about uh, the School Street Project and many other developers who are doing fantastic work around the country. I highly recommend that you get a hold of this book. Um, I talked to Lee uh, right before coming here, and she said, I'm so disappointed that I couldn't be here this year. I definitely want to be there next year, but please tell everyone at CNU hello, and thank you so much for your hospitality last year. So a book came out of that that's going to really raise, I think, I believe that this book is going to make some waves. She's done an incredible job of pointing out how the millennials and the boomers are moving back into more urban settings and that suburbia is gradually shifting to a very much different place and the place of vitality is what all you guys talk about. Oops, I don't know what I did there. So now I want to just move very quickly through some of my own recent investigations into community. What I could see is that there is this huge need for people to understand what you guys are doing. And I wrote an article about three years ago in my um, email newsletter, it's called, I call them minazines, um, you know, not so big, um, <laughs> that uh, really talked about what I knew was missing when I moved here and how it can be a different world. And so 
this uh, article, I got over 60 responses, which for me is a very high number of people saying, if you build one of those, I'm moving. They had no idea that what you're doing is out there. We need a list of places that people can look through, look through the pictures, say, I want to live there, I want to pick that one, just like they do with houses. I don't know if you've got something like that, but I would really be interested in finding a way to collect that data because I can tell you that the people that I talk to are ready and eager, but they don't even know it exists. And so what I've talked about in the, my public uh, discussions is the marriage of not so big house and the new urbanism so that we can create places, and it's already there. We all know that, but most people don't recognize that so that we can start to help people understand where these communities are and how to get one happening in their community. And then one other ingredient, which is the so important part of not so big living, following your heart and doing what you really long to do. And this is the part that really, really speaks to people. It sounds touchy-feely, and in many ways it is, but it's hugely important because it's the people who are making the change to, in their life that are looking for something more. I often call it a different kind of moreness. Bucky Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Every one of you in this audience is doing that. That's why you're here. We are making that new model. As, as Andres said yesterday, there's a change happening, but we can now help move it forward to get it over that tipping point so that more and more people can find what it is that they're looking for. So these are the kinds of slides that I show when I'm talking to general public audiences. None of this is new for you guys, of course, but it's new to the general public. So all generations mingling together. By the way, Steve Mouzon, thank you so much for your photographs in this part. I, uh, he actually went out on a special mission and took me some pictures to illustrate some of these patterns, which are all from a pattern language. But the pictures we need are things that people connect with. So if we could include new urban communities and illustrations of these, this is how you get to people. This is how you get them really, really excited. Activity pockets, we use the word mixed use, doesn't mean much to most people. We've got to use language that communicates what it is that we're really about, what we're really looking for. Housing above, live, work, walk. Even, even the words live, work, we know what that means here, but you'd be amazed how many people hear the term, and try to look like they understand, but they really don't get it yet. So there's, there, it's just the connecting the dots, the super simple. And then learning network. As I spoke about in my uh, early childhood, I learned from that intermingling of generations. I learned from the old lady that was sitting watching as I was playing in the green. And when we were doing something bad, she was sort of going, mm -mm. you know, you can think, well, that's judgmental of her. But this is how generations teach each other. But if they don't get that interweaving, it never happens. And I think a lot of what we find missing and really going down the tubes in our culture today is because of that lack of intermingling. We all know this in this room. But to be able to help people understand how critical it is to make it a more thing, not a less thing. And that's so core. And then finally, a pattern that uh, Alexander, I think, calls old people everywhere. I changed it to senior citizens everywhere. <laughs> but the, the point is just that integration. I know that so many of the boomers are looking for an alternative and are very fearful of what they have to look forward to. Just being able to let people know there are new urban communities all around you that have a vastly superior environment that you can age in place in. And I hope over time where we can interweave the assisted living and independent living situations that allow people to stay in their homes and have those resources come to them when they need them. I've worked a lot with um, Ross Chapin and I think that his pocket neighborhoods, um, and many of you will know his book, that it's actually for sale here, teach us also a lot of lessons, not only about the scale of house and about interconnectedness, but also about how to 
share things. And I think he's done a very good job of talking about the ability to have, for example, one lawnmower for eight smaller houses. You know, that, that we don't need the replication of services in every single house. So that part of talking about sharing things is something that needs a lot more attention and a lot more, um, to, make, to make it not far out to do it, to make it something that's built right into the infrastructure of the community. And so as some of you know, um, these pocket neighborhoods are actually oriented around a green area rather than around a street so that people get to meet each other in that green area and the, the, the parking is well hidden. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but for those that don't know, well worth a read. And then the community gathering place, the same idea of a shared place. Each community decides how to use that differently from a tool shed to a guest bedroom that everybody can use so that when somebody's staying, they don't have to have that guest bedroom in their own, their own house. It's stuff like that that we need to start talking about. As I've been listening, I uh, listened to Richard Louvre the other day, I was really moved by his comments about children and the city and how we've lost contact. If you haven't seen this documentary, Escape from Suburbia, I highly recommend it. There's some good material in it, but there's one part that profoundly moved me, and that was about an area in south um, central Los Angeles. It was a 14-acre, basically urban farm. It didn't belong to anybody, but the community had started to create a place where everyone could grow their own vegetables. It was supporting about 350 families. And in the video, you can feel the joy of people being in that area, of being so alive. And it, just, you, it was like the heart of the community. And then, of course, very, very sadly, the, the person who owned the land wanted to turn it into a warehouse. Absolutely his prerogative. But what I got to see was every urban community needs a heart. It needs that urban farm. These people know how to farm. That's what they've done their whole lives until they moved to Los Angeles. So having that place, that vibrant place, is what will make the shift. So there's something that is a new model, just visible as just sort of happenstance, that could transform ghettos really completely transform them. So that's the kind of thing that I think we need to start talking more about. Show people, show them how, how it's done. So recently, really since September 11th of 2001, we've been subjected to crisis after crisis after crisis. And I believe in many ways we have learned a hugely important lesson from these crises. When you see what happens in a crisis, you see that people forget all of their worries about their own turf and they extend. They become connected with their neighbors in ways they didn't even think possible. So these crises are helping us to see that the thing that really matters is our connection, is our relationship with our friends, our family, our neighbors. And for a lot of people, it's very hard to recognize that until they go through something like this. Recently, we've had enough of them that a huge number of people in this country are feeling that, are seeing that's what's important. I need to design for that. And so I think we're moving from a world where it's really focused on me and my, my, my family to a larger sense of we. It's happening right before our eyes, and it's very difficult to catch in the moment, but you can see it in all of these things that we're, we're growing through together. And so this is where my discussion about the not-so-big life really comes in. Because a not-so-big life is about doing what you love. It's about really focusing on what is it that is your gift. We all end up thinking about the, the, all the stuff that we've got to handle. And so we end up having a world that's filled with too much. We've got too much stuff. Those of you who are um, animal rights activists, I'm really sorry, but you are the donkey. <laughs> but this is, this is the, the point is that we are being run by our stuff. We're building a bigger house because we've got too much stuff for the smaller house, but we don't realize that we are just acquiring and acquiring and acquiring to try to fill a void inside us that can't be filled with buying more. 
And then we're also, many of us, way too busy. Now that we've got all these electronic devices, which are so addictive, they're wonderful, they give us access to so much, but they also can run us ragged. So we have to start to become much more conscious of the decisions we're making in our lives. Look at, do I want to have every screen on in my house all day long? Or is there a period where I have them off? When I'm writing, I don't turn my email on until after lunch. It sounds outrageous, I know, but it works. And people don't fall off the planet because I didn't respond until one. So it's that kind of thinking that we have to start to sort of take back the part of our lives that is the part that nurtures us. And so not so big living is really looking at everything in your life as though you're a student of life. That's how I often characterize myself, as a student of life. I have a quote from the book that says, when you look with the eyes of a student, everything can teach you. And I do mean everything. Everything that happens in your life is there to show you to you. And so we're doing all these things, but at the core, we are human beings learning how to live. And so I want to just show you a few images. I'm going to stop talking, and I want you to look and I want you to just realize the majesty that we live in and around every day. These are not photoshopped. We live in an awesome world. And we're going so fast, most of the time, we don't even see it. I know there are people in this room, I was almost one of them, that didn't step outside the hotel the whole time I'm here. But I look out my window, and there are the most beautiful mountains. It's an incredible place. We're so busy with all of our thinking that we miss the point. And so what I really ask people to do in the Knots of Big Life is to slow down enough to recognize that life is really the experiencing of this extraordinary experience. And then when we bring ourselves back to that, then we have an inner compass that allows us to do what we really long to do. We have to take a breather to recognize it. And so this uh, you know, phrase, be here now, or to be present, is really what you were just doing in looking at those pictures. You were completely here looking. And that's where life happens. And so what I ask each one of you in this audience to do is to ask yourself, what is it that really inspires me? Many of you in this room are doing it. And I commend you for that. But pay attention to what really inspires you and place your focus there. Because as you focus on it, our thoughts are the architects of our lives. So as you focus on it, you bring more of that into your life. You don't even have to go out and find it. John McClendon found me when I stopped trying to find a builder that would work with me. It was right there in front of me. It had been there for two months, and I hadn't been paying attention. So look at what's coming to you that you're not paying attention to, because it is where your dream resides. And that is the bridge to a sustainable future, because when we want something, as several people over the course of the last couple of days have said, we are a part of this planet. We are a part of the ecosystem. And when the planet needs something, we are moved to respond. And we do. But if you keep stopping that response, it can't happen through you. So pay attention to what you're moved to do. And then you'll find the life that you've always thought you would have to wait until you retired in order to live. So this is what I believe Gandhi was really telling us, that the only way to change the world is to change yourself. And the way that that phrase came about was a wonderful story. A woman came up to Gandhi with her um, very overweight son, and she asked Gandhi to tell her son to stop eating all the sugar that he was eating. And Gandhi looked at the little boy and then looked at the woman and then said, Madam, I'd like you to bring him back in a week. She said, okay. She walked away dutifully, came back a week later, and said to Gandhi, now will you tell my son to stop eating all this sugar? And he looked the little boy in the eye, 
And he said, son, I want you to st stop eating all these sweets and candy. They're not good for you. And the woman then turned to Gandhi and said, so why couldn't you have said that a week ago? And he said, madam, a week ago, I did not know if I could stop eating sweets and candy. We must be the change we wish to see in the world. Now, we can giggle, but the point is that his, he knew that his words could have no effect on that child until he was doing what he was asking the child to do. We know this from our children. If you are asking a kid to stop lying and you're lying yourself and they know it, it's not going to happen. But when you actually embody what it is that you're asking, the world changes with you. And that's what you're doing here. You are changing the world by living what you know. And that's how the world changes. It, it's palpable in this place. That's why you keep coming back, because there are passionate people doing what they love to do. The world changes as you change. So I encourage you to stay clear on what it is that you are really longing to do, what you love to do, what you have the ability to do, and place your focus there. In the architectural world, in the homeowner world, and the new urban world, I've tried to interlink people. In a way, my role in the world is to link people. And so on my website, you'll see that there are, there's a home professionals directory for people to find architects and builders and landscape architects who can help them make their own houses not so big. I'd like to be able to do the same thing and help people link to the new urban communities that are the places they really want to live. I have a button there about the new urbanism. I'd love to hear from all of you if you've got things that are missing there that I should be including. And then if you're interested in staying up to date on um, what I'm doing in the world, the Minazine button that's on the top uh, left-hand side will give you a tool to be able to see what I'm up to. You join my, my email list. And I'm also very, very active on Facebook. If you want to tell people about your communities, Post it on my Facebook page and I'll repost so that people can find it. This is the way that we can share. And it's a sharing that's how the word comes out. So what I really want to, to impart to you is that right now is the time. That you can feel it. We're post-recession. Everybody's ready for something new. It's time for all of us to speak what we know. And we really will be creating a happier and much, much healthier world in the process. Thank you so much.